The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of faithchurch.com. You have a divine destiny that no one else can fulfill the way that you can. I believe that scripture gives us this amazing picture of what it looks like to move from a woman who feels like a victim to an overcoming victor. If you wouldn't have went through what you've gone through, if Hope wouldn't have went through what she's gone through, if I wouldn't have went through the divorce and gone through what I went through, I wouldn't have no anointing. Stop being mad at where you are and thank God. Someone has told you that you can't go on or someone has told you how hard this situation is gonna be for you. You can either believe the person who told you that or you can believe the God who told you that you're gonna be victorious through this thing. Hey, West Palm Beach, have I got a weekend for the ladies of South Florida. We are having the beautiful women's conference. And I say it funny because it's not just beautiful, which I know you are inside and out, even though you don't feel it. But it's about be you, be beautiful, be unique, be special, be who you're created to be. Don't try and be like everybody else. They're already being them. Be you. I know that's kind of pushing you and blowing your mind a little bit. That's why I want to invite you to the conference. Tickets are so inexpensive. Matter of fact, students are only $25. Oh, and the first 500 get the cutest tumbler because we give free gifts when you come in. Oh, we have so much planned. Matter of fact, I got my friend Real Talk Kim. She's getting ready to talk to you. The girl is spicy, but she's so real. Hashtag why she got the name Real Talk. But she's so real. You are going to eat her up. If you don't already know her, that's why we've got her on because you, you, once you get to know her, you're going to be like, I need to hear her. Her. So we've got this breakfast, we've got this lunch, we got this after party, we got these chocolate fountains, we got a reason to dress up or don't. And oh my gosh, you just need to see Real Talk Kim. You just need to see these highlights, but you need to get your computer out, get your tickets at www.iamwoman.tv or call the office 561 285 5000. Right now, let's get my girl Real Talk. We love to judge those people, we love to kick them when they're down. And so what it does is the enemy is wanting to break you down so you would never walk back into a church again because of church hurt, because people hurt you. But what I'm telling you tonight is it ain't the church hurt. When you are walking out of a church because of church folk, folk it's because you put your, your faith in them and not in God. So what the enemy does is he's got you focused on the wrong stuff, baby. The greater your calling, the more they're going to talk. And what God is doing is he's exposing people in your, in your season, in your season of brokenness. Because he's about to elevate you. And as he elevates you into your season of wholeness, they can't go with you. What he's doing is he's exposing things in your life so that you can see who they are. Because people arrive with you as long as there's some gas in the car. But you let that gas run out. Where are they at? And he's exposing them so that you don't spend your whole life. Allowing yourself to feel broken. You know what the greatest thing I did? I was raised a preacher's kid. Can I come down here? I've been wanting to jump on this thing all night long. Can I? I was like, I'm going to jump and just crash. <laughs> the greatest thing I did was in 2006, my whole life, I was a preacher's kid in UPC. I was raised that Women can't cut their hair. They can't wear makeup. Men look like they just stepped out of GQ. I was like, God, you hate women. So I came into this world because the enemy knew that one day I was going to be preaching all over the world. And I wouldn't go care what nobody thought. So what he did was he allowed me to come into a family at a very early age. See, some of y'all feel like y'all been fought your whole life. You have. Because you got such a destiny and a calling on the inside of you that the enemy's trying to shut your mouth. And he's done it for a long time. But at some point in your life, you get to a turning point where you finally say, I'm going to get on Ambien to go to sleep and I'm going to get on Xanax to get up. Which only reason you would be on that mess is because you are thinking and caring and listening to what people think about you. Because if you were focused was his way instead of this way, instead of going and scoping out and talking and gossiping and letting people tell you the trash they're saying, about, you wouldn't need to be on nothing. And I'm going to tell y'all something. It's a lot easier to serve Jesus. Because all that Ambien and Xanax does is makes you fat. And then, you, and then you're walking around depressed because you're fat. See how the enemy works? 
You walking around with back boobs and... <laughs> because when you... I'm, I'm a, and listen, I ain't beating you up if you want medication. Sometimes life just hits you and you need something to get you through. But you've got to find out in the midst of your taking medication that I'm about to find out the true living God that's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You get on the ambient and all you're doing at night, you lie. You're getting up and eating all your food for lunch tomorrow. You wake up the next day with spaghetti sauce on you. Because ambient makes you eat in your sleep. When you got a God, man, you ain't got to get on that mess. You got to face that mess. You got to wake up and realize that that stuff can't take your birthday. That person can't take your birthday. And in 2006, I finally lost everything. Because I was, y'all, y'all look at me, look. 44, right? That sweet little baby over there is calling me Star Barbie, so I'm just saying. But in 2006, I'd ran my whole life. And I found myself back at my mother and my father's house after being married for 16 years to the love of my life. I loved this man's guts. He told me that I was lucky to have him. I believed him. Now I look at him like, huh? <laughs> you, you wish you'd have got better, don't you? But see, what the enemy did was he had me looking for love in all the wrong places because he was prolonging the process of when, me, when I would get to where I am today. And I found myself back at my mother and my father's house and in that UPC religion, they told me if you get divorced, you're going to hell on a slip and slide. I'm like, after I realized, man, I'm about to go to hell on a slip and slide because this thing's over. I remember laying in my bed one day and I said, God, you, can you just do me a favor? If I got to go to hell for this, can you just grease that slide down so I go fast? Like, can we at least make this thing fun? He said, I'm about to show you what I'm really like. I'm not like people. I'm a God of grace and mercy. I need you to stop repeating patterns. I need you to stop thinking that you might as well keep on messing up because you already messed up once. He said, I need, you to sh I need you to get into placement so that I can get you centered. Because once I get you centered, what I'm going to be able to do through you, I couldn't have done through you if you'd went to seminary, honey. Because what I'm doing through you, through your storm, is I'm giving you some oil. You can't pay for oil. You can't pay for that crushing. You can't pay for those nights when you've laid in a fetal position crying your eyes out. When your joints and your fingers are aching because everybody's talking about you. Not only did you lose your family, but now you're staring at yourself in your mother's house having to start all over at 36. And I found myself in that place. I was sick and tired of watching religion because all I ever saw was a bunch of hypocrites. And I said, God, if that's where I'm supposed to go, I ain't going. And I kept having one foot in the world, one foot out. I was expecting a full-time God on a part-time relationship. One night he told me, I said, God, take this pain away from me. I'm so ashamed. I want to defend myself so bad with everybody on Facebook. He said, don't you dare open your mouth. You just live so nobody believes it and watch me vindicate you. He said, I need you to commit to me. Y'all, when I tell you I was the one on the bar doing the nay-nay, <laughs> I wasn't pray pray. <laughs> I was that preacher's kid for real, honey. If I was going to do it, I was going to do it all the way. And all of that shame and all of that guilt kept coming back to my heart. Every time I would try to get ahead and get out of that place of pain, I would be taken back because the enemy would give me a screenshot of all the mess that I did. And he said, if people ever find out, you'll never amount to nothing. And so at that moment, I said, God, I said, why couldn't you have healed my marriage? And God said, because you didn't ask me one time if that was your husband. And now y'all have been married for 17, almost 17 years. And you're mad at me because of storms you created. He said, you can either get better or you can get better. And I said, well, if you ain't going to fix my marriage, then can you please take this pain away? He said, I can't take it away. you got to give it to me. you got to give it to me, and you got to get up and walk away. And he said, and after you get well, 
I want you to open your mouth and I want you to show people how to get up and walk away. How do I quit talking about the past? How do I keep trying to right the wrongs and just let it be gone? You get up and walk away. You get up and get dressed. Put your makeup back on. Go get your hair cut. Shave your beard. Put the ho-hos down and begin to live again. Take back your life one day at a time. And you know what? They'll talk about you. But give them something to talk about. They're going to lie on you. They did Jesus. Jesus knew Judas was going to set him up before he did. He said, I got this. You got some Judases in your world that were planted there because God wanted you to see that you were going to make it. God wanted you to see that you were going to recover. God wanted you to see that you matter. That you have a purpose, you have a plan, you have a destiny, and it is so big it's going to blow your mind. I told you my girl was spicy, right? Mm, She is so fun. You have no idea how much camaraderie, how much friendship, how much fun, how much electricity is in the conference. That's why I want you there. I don't want you to miss it. Tickets are super inexpensive. We have gifts for the first 500 tickets, which you can edge in on real quick if you do it right away. We might already be past it. Hurry up, get your tickets today. How do you get tickets? www.iamwoman.tv. It's June 23rd and 24th. Just two days, Friday night, Saturday. Oh, and uh, you can also call the office, 561-285-5000. Let's show you a few highlights of what's about to happen. Oh, and then let's get with my Scottish friend. She's Sheila Walsh, you're going to love her. She's sold five million books, five million books. How long does it take to sell five million books? I don't know, but Sheila's done it. She's been on CBN, she's on the James Robinson Show. Everybody knows Sheila. So you're gonna meet Sheila. Let's see these highlights. much when Pastor Nicole was up speaking and we brought a friend this year. Yes, this and is my first time. Yes. I'm so inspired. Yes. I'm definitely coming back next year. Yes, get your tickets early. You have to be here next year. to get through this trial and tribulation that is coming all around you. I, God has a strength that says, yes, you've gotten phone calls. Yes, you've gotten bad reports. Yes, then if you will seek me with all that is within you. John 10, 10 said, the devil came to bring you destruction. But, 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 God says, I have come to give you life abundantly. Well, you won't have to listen to me for very long to work out that even though I live now in Dallas, Texas, I did not start there. I'm from the south of Scotland. (laughs) I was born in the southwest of Scotland, a small fishing town by the ocean. And I love, there's something about living by the ocean that I loved. As a child, it wasn't the 
the kind of beaches that you think of if you see movies of, you know, the Florida beaches, which are so peaceful and beautiful or anywhere like that. I was born by the rugged west coast of Scotland. And so what I loved to do was after a storm, I loved to walk along the beach and see what had been tossed up onto the shore. I don't know if you've ever done that after a storm, because if it's really wild, you can find all sorts of things. I found old glass bottles, I found shoes. I once found a diamond engagement ring. Yeah, three diamonds and two sapphires. I was 12 years old and I said to my mom, what do I do with it? And she said, well, we'll take it to the police station and you'll hand it in and hopefully someone who's lost it, you know, will, will come and claim it. So I dutifully took it to the police station and the gentleman there said, well, we will keep it for six months and if no one claims it after six months, then you will get it back. So after six months, I got a little letter from our local police department saying no one had claimed the ring. So I collected it, so I was officially engaged at 12. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But one of the things that I think is interesting in life is I believe that almost everything we see around us is a picture of something spiritually that's happening around us. Because just as storms throw up all sorts of debris on the shore, when we walk through spiritual storms or emotional storms, if you walk through a really tough season in life, I've discovered in my life it'll toss up some things on the shoreline of your heart. And I think what happens is it shows you what you actually believe as opposed to what you hope you believe or even what you think you believe. I mean, it's easy to say, I believe that God is good until you walk through a season where maybe your husband says, I don't love you anymore and walks away. It's easy to say, I believe that God is all powerful until like a friend of mine, you've had to bury your second child. I mean, that'll shake your faith. It's easy to say that I believe that God is kind until you pray over and over and over. And it seems as if God's not listening to you. Storms serve a huge purpose because they actually show us where we're at in our faith and what we believe. I want to look at one issue today that I think every single one of us, to some degree or another, is gonna face, and that is heartache. When you walk through a situation where something happens and literally you feel as if your heart's gonna break. I often wondered if that was possible. You know how people will say, you know, I'm just broken hearted. But about a year ago, I went through a season with some friends that had been friends of mine for, gosh, almost 20 years. And there was a slight misunderstanding. And you know how sometimes even a slight misunderstanding can divide people? And so it was like this huge breach came in our relationship. And, and I really tried everything I knew to do at that time to repair it. And for whatever reason, um, it just was not gonna happen. I think that person felt wounded and did, just was not in a place where they wanted to talk. My doctor actually ended up sending me to a cardiologist because they said, there's something wrong with your heart. And I was put on a monitor for a while and then eventually the cardiologist said, well, we got the results back. Your heart is really healthy. But he said, it's beating at a strange rhythm and they said, have you lost someone recently? And I said, well, kind of. That it actually happens that when we're going through tremendous heartache, it has a, a physical impact on our life and it has an impact on our spiritual life too. I don't know if you remember, but on May the 20th of 2013, there was an F5 tornado that swept through a little town called Moore, Oklahoma, about maybe two hours north of where I live with my husband, Barry, and our son, Christian. It was on the ground for an almost press, unprecedented 39 minutes, and it was a mile wide. 23 people died that day, and seven of them were eight-year-old children. The tornado hit the school, and they had so little warning that one teacher wasn't able to get her children into a safe place and seven of those little ones lost their lives. Once, after the first few days, um, they made it clear that those of us who wanted to help could, could drive up there and help. And so at Women of Faith, we joined up with Samaritan's Purse, Franklin Graham's ministry. And we drove up early in the morning and they gave us all our assignments and the different things we had to do. And basically, I mean, television never does justice to what these things actually look like. Because as we drove in, some areas were completely normal and then you would come to a place where there was just nothing, absolutely nothing. There was a whole street where there wasn't one single thing, not a glass still standing. 
It was horrifying. And so they said to us, what we're going to do is you'll be in teams of five and you literally will just go through every piece of rubble on this concrete slab and see if there's anything at all that's salvageable. So we just, we had on our masks and our gloves and we got working. And eventually this one older gentleman came up and stood beside me and I, I introduced myself and I said, can I help you, sir? And he said, this was my home. And I said, I'm so sorry, I'm so, so sorry. And I said, is there anything in particular you want us to look for? And he said, yes, will you please look for my son's medals? He lost his son in Afghanistan. And the only really tangible thing he had left of the memory of this courageous son were these two medals. I don't know how you approach prayer, but on that day I was like, Lord, I don't ask you for a lot of specific things, but please, this man, has been through so much. He has lost so much. You know where these medals are. Please, Lord, will you help us find them? And we dug and we dug and we dug, and there they were. It was almost like they'd been sheltered. You know, there was a few books around them, and there they were. And so he was just, he wept as we were able to put them back into his hands. But at the end of the day, Samaritan's Purse has this fabulous, um, I think they do it every time they clear an area of devastation. Whoever had that, that home, each person of the team of five or six who was working on it signed a Bible and, you know, put a word of encouragement or a favorite scripture, and that would be presented to the, the person, the homeowner. And as we gathered around this sweet man and we all began to pray for him, my heart ached because I thought, Lord, it seems, I know your word is powerful, but it seems as if we're giving him this and that's all he's got. But as we handed that Bible to him, he said, um, this is is a wonderful place to start to rebuild your life. And I thought, gosh, that's amazing because obviously what he knew was he knew the Lord before the storm hit. And it's one of the things I'm learning more than anything else, of course, you cannot wait until the storm hits to get the word of God deep inside you. You know, God's word says um, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And sometimes I think when people are in pain, we almost use the word of God as a weapon. You know, you'll, someone will be brave enough within a group to say, I just wanted to share the fact that it's been a year since my child died and I'm still struggling. And I sat in a group like that. And then another woman said to her, well, just remember, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And it shut her down like that. I think when pain is the freshest, words should be the fewest. Those of us in the body of Christ should be those who are able more than anybody else to minister to those who are heartbroken. You know, in one of the darkest moments of my life, it was a night back in 1992, when I, I don't know if you've ever experienced this yourself, where you feel as if there's something wrong with you, but you're not sure what it is. The way I described it in my journal was, I felt as if I lived on the edge of a volcano with this distant rumble underneath me. And if you'd asked me, well, what's wrong? Have you done something terrible? Are you in some terrible sin? I wouldn't have been able to come up with anything, but I just felt there's something wrong with me, Lord. And I went from one morning being the co-host of the 700 Club, and by that evening, I was in the locked ward of a psychiatric hospital. My father took his own life in a psychiatric hospital when he was 34 years of age. And that night when I was admitted, I was 34 years of age. My father had had a massive brain injury and had attempted to kill me when I was five before he was taken off to that psychiatric institution. And he escaped one night and they searched for him all through the night and they found him in the morning. He was dead in the river, caught in the salmon nets. And when you are as a child, have the person you love most in the world, my dad was my hero. And the last thing I remembered wasn't even the yelling and screaming. What I remembered more than anything was the look in my father's eyes. If someone, as a child, when you think of someone that you love so much and who loved you can suddenly hate you, there must be something terribly, terribly wrong with you. And I grew up with such a sense of being not good enough. And I determined as a young woman, I was gonna work so hard for God that he would never turn on me. But you know, it was actually one of God's kindest gifts to let my life crash. And that night when I was admitted to the psychiatric hospital, I was 34 years old exactly the same age as my, as my dad. But you know what I discovered? In the darkest night of your life, the Son of God 
shows up in ways you've never known him before. Scripture says the Lord is close to those who are brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. But you will never know that more than when you are brokenhearted or when your spirit is so crushed you can hardly breathe. I wrote in my journal that first night, I never knew that you lived so close to the floor. And I also discovered one of the most powerful prayers on this earth. One of the most powerful prayers on this earth is one of the most simple prayers on this earth. It's simply the name Jesus. When you can't pray for yourself, when you're so heartbroken you just don't have words, when you don't even know what direction you should pray, there's nothing more powerful than simply praying the name of the one who refused to live without you because he loved you so much. So what I've done in my own life, which has helped me, and I'd like to suggest just three quick things for you. When you find yourself in a dark place, number one, call on his name. Call on his name. The enemy has no defense against a daughter of the king who calls on the name of her father. So no matter if that's all you can say, just call on the name of Jesus. Number two, give him your heartache. Speak it out. This is what it says in Psalm 63, verse 7. Because you are my helper, I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. And three, copy out a few powerful scriptures that will encourage you and just have them with you. I carry them with me everywhere I go. Psalm 34, that's the one that talks about the Lord being close to those who are brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. But here's a great one. Psalm 56 verse 8 says this, You, you have kept count of all my tossings. Ever laying awake at at night, tossing and you can't get to sleep, worrying, thinking, Lord, what am I going to do? The Lord has not missed one of those tossings. Says you kept count of my tossings and you put my tears in your bottle. I have a little tear bottle from Jerusalem. It's what would be given to a widow as she walked to have her husband buried. Every tear would be caught in that bottle and interred with him. Do you know that there's not one tear you've ever shed that has hit the ground unredeemed? So in the midst of heartache, remember, the Lord loves you. He is close to you. Call on his name in the darkest, most terrifying storm. And the Lord has promised that he will deliver the righteous. And all God's girls said, Amen. Amen. Sheila, she's such a wise woman, isn't she? I want you to get with Sheila's wisdom and Kim's spiciness and me just being me, but that's just you be you. You know that you have a thumbprint that is totally unique, a thumbprint made to make an imprint on the world that only you can make. Instead of celebrating trying to be the same, why don't we celebrate our differences? And that's what the conference is all about. That's why I don't want you to miss it. Light breakfast on Saturday, box lunch from Panera, a little bit of shopping, a lunch panel that is off the chain. Text your friends and get online, www.iamwoman.tv. We're right there at the Palm Beach Lakes High School in the auditorium. Everybody knows where it's at, super close to 95. I wanna see you there. Uh, and if you don't if you don't get online, you can call the office, 561 561- 285-5000. Get your tickets today. Don't miss it. I want to see you there. The preceding program was paid for by the friends and partners of faithchurch.com.